As we all know, owning and operating a business these past 24 months in Washington State has been a tremendous struggle, and it's not been easy uh, at any point. But Washington State lawmakers are not making it any easier with mazes of new rules and regulations. And one of those new rules and regulations incentivizes turning employees against their employers, and perhaps worse. Our small business director, Mark Harmsworth, is here with a session to explain all that. Mark? Well, thanks, Dave, for the, the kind intro. And I'd like to welcome our two guests today, uh, Representative Kelly Chambers, who has served in the House of Representatives since uh, 2019. And uh, I got to know her as I was leaving the, the House of Representatives just a little. And she's been a big advocate for small business. She's a small business owner herself and is very active in her community. And also Patrick Connor, who, uh, who's representing the NFIB today. He's been in politics for a long time, but uh, as the director over at the NFIB since 2009. And uh, again, I know I knew Patrick when I served in the House, and he is a staunch supporter of small business and helping employers and employees get the best value and the best products out to market for everyone here. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about some of the things we've seen the state do over the last few years um, on requiring small business to do different things on their behalf. And we're going to start with a conversation about uh, a House bill that was introduced last year, which we're likely to see reintroduced this year. Um, the bill is uh, House Bill 1076. So if you look that up on the Washington State uh, legislative website, you can read all the gory details. Um, it made it through the House and into the Senate, but then it died in rules. This bill was known as the Ketan Bill, but as of today, we're going to rename it the Bounty Bill because that's really what it is. It, it creates the ability for employees uh, that are disgruntled for whatever reason to go after their employers and actually get a monetary award. Um, so in, in layman's terms, what the bill does, it allows you as an employee or as an ex-employee, in fact, to bring a lawsuit against an employer for a perceived or a real sometimes um, violation of any LNI rule in the workplace. And so you can see how this could create, and this doesn't have to be on your behalf, that can be on behalf of somebody else. So you saw some activity in the workplace that didn't affect you directly, but affected somebody else. You've decided that that was a violation of law. So you can now bring that as a, bring a, a, a key TAM lawsuit uh, or a bounty bill lawsuit against that employer um, and as a result, you'll actually receive a settlement. The, if the case is settled, you'll get 40%. In most cases, the state will get 60%. Um, places a huge burden on employers. Obviously, opens up um, multiple avenues of litigation because you can imagine if you have an employee that's disgruntled and is laid off for performance reasons, I mean, legitimate reasons, and they decide just to go ahead and do this, um, it turns them into whistleblowers for the state or spies for the state on the ground. And this is uh, it's going to affect business significantly. The bill's likely to come back this year. And I wanted uh, both Kelly, uh, uh, sorry, excuse me, Representative Chambers to comment on this and Patrick as well um, from their both of their perspectives. And why don't we start with uh, Representative Chambers? I know you voted on this bill last year and you voted against it. So tell us a little bit about that, why you think this bill is necessary or not. And if not, why not? Uh, thanks, Mark. Hi, and good to see you. Hi to everyone. Good to see Patrick. Well, you left a, an important piece of my um, bio out, and that's um, I'm a NFIB alum. <laughs> so, um, you know, as, as a small business owner, I've, I've been in business for myself for 18 years and, um, you know, really thought that that was kind of one of the, you know, levels of expertise, you know, that it was bringing to the legislature. So, um, tried, you know, I always try to, um, you know, look at things from a, a small business perspective when looking at legislation, um, in addition to, you know, the um, constituents that I represent. But this bill, you know, I don't think it's necessary. I think we have um, many worker protections in place in Washington and um, that should be followed. And, and many of those protections have, um, um, you know, pathways to correct violations should, should there be any. So, um, we ought to be emphasizing that. And, you know, there's, 
I think sometimes there's just a general tone uh, in the legislature that that if you're in business, there's a nefarious element to that. You're doing it to take advantage of people. And and the reality is, and I think the voice that you know I bring to small business is we value our employees, we value our customers, and we want to do right by them. And we want those opportunities to, to protect them. Um, it's not a us versus them uh, sort of thing. And, and you know that's one thing that. Um, I think Representative Gina Mossbrucker, who was also a small business owner, often, you know, states is like those employees, those are our family, we care for each other. And, you know, I could just tell you right now, you know, in, in my business, in my office, um, um, we've had we've had two deaths um, of family members in our office this week. And, you know, everybody's there to fill in for each other to to, you know, offer that support, you know, for our employees. And, you know, that that gets translated just that's our philosophy and how, how we operate. Um, this bill um, was, you know, completely party line. Um, there, there, you know, I'm a Republican. There were no Republicans supporting this bill. We did, um, you know, fight vigorously on this and offered a number of amendments that we thought could improve this, and um, they were just repeatedly um, rejected. So, um, happy to go over those, and um, but I'll give Patrick some time to introduce himself and um, fill in anything that I've left out. <laughs> Well, thanks very much, Mark and Representative Chambers. Uh, the, the KETAM bill um, or the Sue Your Employer bill, or in California, they call it PAGA, the Private Attorney General's Act, uh, it really is unnecessary. And that's not just an opinion. I think you can take a look at some facts and make that decision for yourself. Uh, there are nearly a dozen laws that this bill would cover where employees, uh, workers already have the ability to file a complaint, most uh, often with the State Department of Labor and Industries, and in a couple of cases with the Human Rights Commission. Uh, the Department of Labor and Industries has not asked at all for this authority to be given to private individuals to sue on the department's behalf. The department hasn't claimed that they are overworked or understaffed in this area. They haven't asked for more investigators. They haven't asked for more adjudicators. Uh, this has been introduced and pushed forward by the trial bar. Um, it's, it's plain and simple. This is a Democrat priority because the trial bar wants this legislation enacted. Uh, they don't intend to vigorously enforce workplace safety and health laws on behalf of aggrieved workers. They intend to shake down particularly small business owners uh, and do so using the shell of this law to have the authority to sue on behalf of a worker or group of workers. If they, um, but uh, in most cases where we've seen this type of law in effect, California again in particular, uh, these things tend to be settled because they're, they're nuisance suits. So for many employers, it is a lot easier and cheaper to write a check to the trial attorney uh, to settle it outside of, of the department and the adjudicative process than it is to lawyer up and try and fight these things uh, in court. They cost too much time and too much money for too little result. So, you know, it's, it's nothing but a, basically a naked power grab by the trial bar and a way to shake down employers to make more money. Yeah, so basically what you're saying, Patrick, is we don't need this law. It, it's, it's unnecessary. It's a law looking for a, a solution, a problem that doesn't even really exist. And, and from what Representative Chang was saying in her own company, I mean, most companies, and as you know, I own a small business as well. My employees get on pretty good with each other, you know, and we work through things if we have a disagreement. So uh, for that sort of a situation, this is a, a, a solution looking for a problem that just does not exist. And uh, as you mentioned, Patrick, um, the motivation behind this uh, sounds like the trial lawyers, or at least donations to their supported representatives who introduced this bill in order to get this through, because they're the ones that are really going to benefit. Am I reading that correctly? Yes, I believe that you are. And that's absolutely the driving force behind this bill is the trial bar. And it's not terribly surprising that a trial attorney who serves in the legislature is a prime sponsor of the legislation. Mark, but I think it's, we, we can, we can go over who, who testified last year, you know, in, in support of this. Um, uh, advocating for it was uh, Working Washington, uh, UFCW, uh, that union, SEIU, another union, um, uh, the Labor Council, and then those opposing it were 
Independent Business Association, uh, the Association of Washington Businesses, uh, the Defense Trial Lawyers, Liability Coalition Reform, the Construction Industry Council, um, Alaska Airlines, the Food Industry Association, the Hospital Association. There were some issues with this bill regarding uh, providers of interstate uh, transportation. That's um, that speaks to the Alaska Airlines piece, but um, that kind of gives you who who the players were um, for and against this. Yeah, it it really paints a picture of what was being driven here um, and who was trying to drive this conversation. Uh, why do you think, and um, without being too obvious, that there was an award given to the real tour of forty percent? I mean, is that is that a rhetorical question? <laughs> you know, um, I wondered about those rates. I'm not an attorney, but. Um, I thought like <laughs> personal injury attorneys were taking 30% and then it's like, oh, this is 40%. So um, I don't know what the going rate is these days, but um, that's pretty hefty. Yeah. Um, I also noticed under the bill that political subdivisions can sue on behalf of these employees as well. Did you have, Patrick, maybe you want to weigh in on this. Do you have any thoughts on that? What, what do you think the motivation was behind that? Allowing a like a municipality, for example, or some kind of um, water district to sue on behalf of an employee for something else? I don't think that that particular uh, cause of action got a whole lot of discussion or robust debate in the legislature. I also found it rather interesting, but I think it's easier to hide your true intentions when you've got a long list of folks that are able to sue. Uh, I think really what the crux of this is, is that it allows third parties uh, to sue on behalf of allegedly aggrieved workers. So I, as an aggrieved employee, am not the one necessarily who has to initiate this process, but um, a union, and you saw many of them sign in and support or testify in support of this bill, are able to go after employers uh, claiming that workers have uh, had their rights violated in some way, shape, um, you know, over these dozen different laws that this particular bill seeks to cover. So I think really what this is, is a tool to enrich trial attorneys and to give another cudgel uh, to labor unions trying to forcibly uh, unionize businesses or to exact certain concessions during negotiations um, away from the bargaining table. So instead, uh, you get the, the unions uh, who then are able to maybe find a worker to claim that they were somehow uh, mistreated or denied one of their rights under these dozen or so safety and health laws uh, to file a complaint. And then the union is able to pursue litigation on that individual's behalf against that employer. And again, uh, racking up those legal bills and dragging this process out through court uh, is difficult. It's costly, uh, time consuming, and not something that any employer is terribly excited about having to undertake, no matter how frivolous the lawsuit may be and how strong their defense may be. They're still going to end up losing because of, of the, the time that's lost and the cost involved. So I think you need to look a little bit deeper at it, who all is allowed uh, to litigate. But yes, uh, giving this to, uh, I guess, an activist uh, Seattle City Council, I don't know, uh, is also reason for concern. The, the, the other piece with the political subdivisions is, you know, they may be able to bring suit, but, you know, counties and cities are also employers as well that could be, you know, you know, subject to, um, you know, worker complaints. So um, that, that there was that aspect as well. And so, you know, last year when we were debating this, when this came to the floor of the House for debate, you know, I think it was Representative Stokesbury that offered an amendment to say, let's, let's send this back to committee so we can actually have that discussion. So it really wasn't adequately, um, public discussion wasn't d done on that piece. Yeah, so basically, uh, if a union was looking to get a, a foot in the door at an employer where they've been unsuccessful in the past, they could literally find some kind of a area that they could get an employee to file a suit and use that as leverage to get in um, or at least start that process with those employees. I mean, there, there's all sorts of horrible implications of this on the employer who, who, I mean, 99% of employers are just trying to do right by their employees. You know, if, if an employee needs a little extra, I mean, that's something I would consider, you know, if they need a change in their benefits, they need time off. I mean, most employers are doing everything they can, particularly in this job market, to keep their employees happy, employed, and, and, and feeling like they're a, a contributing member of the company. 
And then for this to come along and say, okay, so if, if you don't do exactly what I say, and we, and we know there are employees occasionally like that, um, then yeah, it's a, it's a pretty tough situation. What do you think, um, uh, Representative Chambers, will be the impact? If this was to pass today, what do you think the impact would be on employees? How do you think they're going to react? And what sort of things are you going to see changing in HR policy or, or maybe even hiring processes? Um, you know, we're in a we're in a situation right now. So many employers are are desperate for labor. I mean, I have yet to talk to a a business this this year that says you know we're laying people off or we don't have we don't have work. Everybody's everybody's looking for workers. So you know, it just underscores what you're saying that employers want to hold on to their employees. Um, I think the result of this, and I and it's what we saw in California, is that if this becomes law you're going to see a, a, a massive uptick in, in these kinds of lawsuits. And um, they really, this really, as it's written, doesn't give employers the opportunity to correct. And, you know, that's, that's a key piece. Um, you know, I've, I've said this, you know, for many years, I've been in business for 18 years, you know, so we do make mistakes, but it's how we handle those mistakes that, that really, you know, is, is what we should look towards, you know, if, if, um, you know, say I, an employee didn't clock in or clock out for their shift and, and, and their, their paycheck was wrong. You, we can fix that. That's an easy fix. Um, that's not um, something nefarious. And, and this bill, as we've seen, just doesn't have that, that right to correct uh, in it. I think, um, but, it, but I've also seen, you know, um, over the years, sometimes employees don't exactly know uh, what, what the what the policy is. Um, let's let's say with regards to to payroll, um, if you have a shift worked, you know, over a holiday or uh, over midnight, um, you know, when do you apply those hours for pay? And um, you know, I've seen employees not know. Well, I worked this day. How come I didn't get it on this paycheck? Well, that's because it's part of a different pay period. And, and you, we could sit down side by side and look at a calendar and, and work those things out. So um, once you do that, it's, it's, they're typically very small matters um, that you can clear up. And, you know, I cringe at thinking that a third party could, can come in and, and file a suit against a, a, an employer and that you then have to stop um, doing your business, serving your customers, because you now need to address um, something frivolous that that really um, could be unintentional. And and quite frankly, you know, the, we have um, very strong wage and hour um, laws in place. Um, penalties are very stiff. I think it's what, you know, three times the amount is, is a penalty on wage and hour violations. So, you know, I don't take that lightly. Um, I don't want to mess with employees' money. And I, and I think most employers, you know, agree with that. Like, let's let make that right and, and um, address that very quickly. So, um, you know, the other uh, types of uh, lawsuits that could be brought under this are regarding safety, um, leave, discrimination, um, so when companies have strong policies in place with those things, it eliminates um, the need for um, something like a, a key TAM provision. Um, all employers are required to hang those posters up, um, how to contact l and how to, how to um, address a, a wage and hour violation. And there is, you know, the department there available to investigate any of those claims and, um, you know, you know, back to what we were saying at the beginning, I would, I would expect that if there, if this, if LMI did not have enough staff to investigate these claims that are out there, that um, request for more funding would be in the governor's um, budget, and, and they would be able to demonstrate, you know, with some data that how many claims are out there and um, their inability to to address those. Right. <laughs> the other uh, industry I think <clears throat> could be significantly affected by this is the independent contractors. Um, Patrick, what are your thoughts on how this might affect an employer's relationship with, you know, those temporary workers they bring in to do work in their facilities that they don't have as W-2 employees? Yeah, I think that that's certainly a, a reason for concern, Mark. Um, labor has long maintained that they're, particularly in the construction industry, uh, is sort of a culture of misclassifying workers. 
that somebody who comes in to do a specialized job, uh, oftentimes labor believes ought to be treated as an employee rather than an independent contractor. Um, sometimes those claims are legitimate, most times they are not, uh, but certainly this would give uh, organized labor yet another opportunity to make it very difficult on a general contractor who is using independent contractors to do part of their work. Uh, this would have, could apply in a number of different settings as well. Um, you know, in your own small business, uh, you may have a need temporarily to bring on a specialist in a, a certain kind of skill. Uh, you know, maybe you need a bookkeeper, but for a short period of time, those kinds of things, uh, you as an employer ought to have the ability to find somebody who is willing to contract with you to do that work, who then is also free to contract with representative chambers to do work for her business or to contract with me. Um, and is not bound to any one of the three of us as an employee because that's not their particular business model. Uh, certainly the growing use of, of the gig economy uh, and so-called gig workers is further complicating that issue. Um, and sometimes it is difficult, I think, for policymakers to see the difference between an individual with a certain set of skills and abilities um, who has put out their own shingle, is running their own business, is working for multiple clients, uh, as opposed to somebody who opens an app, signs in to deliver or do a task or you know do whatever, uh, drive someone somewhere. So it's becoming more confusing. And I think those types of, of uh, uncertainties make it even easier for a clever trial attorney and, and for organized labor to misuse a tool like the KETAM law were it to be enacted um, to basically further punish employers uh, as well as uh, really creating a chilling effect on individuals who want to use their own time and talents to provide a good or service to their community. So I think that just from a, a free enterprise perspective, we ought to be worried about uh, the chilling impact that could be had on would-be entrepreneurs if uh, suddenly they become embroiled in these kinds of, of lawsuits as well. Well, I, I think back to, um, if you remember the Permatemp lawsuit that was brought against uh, Microsoft many years ago. And full disclosure, I was a contractor at Microsoft when it happened. And I was uh, caught up in that class action. But that was basically an independent contractor um, or a collection of independent contractors who sued Microsoft because they felt they'd be treated as employees, as contractors. Now, um, and they prevailed in the lawsuit and they were awarded some financial um, benefits as a result of that. And that dramatically changed the uh, contracting business, uh, Microsoft and many other IT companies in the region hire programmers and technical program managers and testers and so on, operations engineers um, to do uh, work over a period of time. Now what they're doing, uh, because businesses are smart and they know how to get around the law if they need to, is they're limiting the, the, um, the term of each of their employees, you're limited to, I think it's either nine months or a year, then you have to take a three month break or whatever the, the current rules are, I've not checked recently, um, but they do that to get around it. And that was a direct result of something very similar to what we're seeing with House Bill 1076, where you know some employees felt, and then obviously they, they prevailed in this case, um, that was the case. Now, the difference though, I think here is in 1076, it doesn't, you can do this on behalf of somebody else. So that would be like those independent contractors suing Microsoft as their contract owner uh, on behalf of another employee in the company. And so I think um, both you representing Chambers and Patrick, um, you, you've both really highlighted the danger of this type of legislation um, that enables an employee for whatever reason. And I think you're absolutely spot on on the settlement side of things. That's exactly what's going to happen. You're going to get uh, somebody who feels there's a perceived um, violation, whether it's real or not, they'll sue and the employer will literally, that's how I would think about it. I would look at the numbers and I would say, is it cheaper for me to settle or is it cheaper for me to go the whole way and die my sword on this one because I know I'm right. And often from a business perspective, it's a financial decision and you will settle. And I think those lawyers that are sponsoring this bill know that. Well, I think Mark, you made two really good points in that example. Number one, there's an existing process that clearly works. Yeah. A company as big and as powerful as Microsoft uh, was forced uh, to make changes to how it interacts with its independent contractors as a result of a class action lawsuit. So again, why do we need a key TAM additional law that would allow third parties 
to further intervene and to create more problems when it was able to be resolved between the aggrieved independent contractors and the entity for whom they were they were working. Uh, and then second of all, of all um, I think it's important to note here, we're talking about technology is a good example of places where there are ongoing changes in the workforce and sometimes the laws don't keep up with those changes. Uh, and you know, at times it does take a, a court or perhaps a legislature to come in and, and change the law or change practices uh, in order to bring the law, bring the situation uh, in line with what uh, the changes in, in technology have occurred. So, you know, Microsoft was operating under a certain set of guidelines and laws that were in effect at the time. Uh, they had apparently a different view of how they could uh, handle independent contractors compared to what those contractors thought. So again, you settled the pro you settled it through an existing process. We don't need a new law. <laughs> and second, uh, you know, the law can be changed then to better reflect evolutions in the workplace. And I think that's going to be one of the things that we as a small business organization are going to have to continue to push the legislature about when it comes to gig workers and emerging platform technology and those kinds of things to match would-be workers with would-be employers um, is that you know looking at, at bills that were passed in the early or mid 1900s probably aren't keeping pace with what's happening in the year 2021 and beyond. I think, Mark, you you um, illustrate why this bill is being referred to as the bounty hunter uh, law. Um, if you're a bounty hunter, you're probably going to go after the uh, biggest fish in a target-rich environment. And in in the example of of um, independent contractors at Microsoft, you know you can have a, a bounty hunter, if you will, taking a swipe and and, and th um, throwing out um, you know allegations. Um, and kind of seeing what sticks. And um, if you get something that sticks and successful, big payoff. Um, and if you, if you fail, there's no cost. So there's a cost to the employer in, in defending themselves, but um, to, to those you know, bringing suit, uh, no skin off their nose. So what stops you from throwing as much out there as you can? Right. And which, you know, I was in preparation for this. I was I was uh, Googling some of um, stuff regarding California and and their law. And the results were filled with uh, attorneys down there that will take on your case. <laughs> yeah, it's the ambulance chaser bill, oh. if you like. Ambulance chaser bounty bill. Yeah. Um, I know I know it's not directly related, but do you think this could affect employers liability rates? Um, obviously, in the private insurance market for um, uh, just uh, you know, straight up liability or maybe errors and emissions as well, those rates would certainly be affected, especially if you have a, a suit filed against you. But do you think the state will want to take a piece of this action through ESD, the Employment Security Department, maybe by tying your uh, employment rates, uh, your LNI rates to this? Do you think that's something that could be considered at some point? Obviously, I think that's a bad idea, but. I wanted to get your thoughts on it. Uh, Patrick. Um, I, I think that's an interesting question. Um, I think the state would probably benefit by seeing increased tax revenue, either through the premium tax that exists on certain types of insurance policies and through the B&O tax, uh, so much as that applies to uh, attorneys and what they would bring in as, as uh, gross receipts from these kinds of activities. Uh, I think it becomes more complicated to try and tie it to either uh, an employer's experience rating for unemployment insurance purposes, because that's impacted when you um, lay off a worker, or terminate a worker, and they're able to collect benefits. Um, and similarly, with labor and industries, your workers' compensation experience rating is based on workplace accidents and the amount of money that's paid out in medical or time loss, uh, basically wage replacement benefits, uh, which is different than when LNI comes out through DOSH, their Division of, of Occupational Safety and Health, and issues you a citation for a safety violation. So you don't have to have an injury occur in order for a safety violation to occur. They issue you a citation, but that doesn't uh, end up being reflected in your workers' comp rates. Um, you know, it still hurts when it's $1,000 to $7,000, depending upon the severity of, of the situation. Uh, but I think it would be more difficult to try and impact 
either UI or workers' comp rates through the KETAM process. But never say never when it comes to uh, the legislature and, and their friends in the trial bar. Mm. Yeah, I think it would take some changes to you know current ESD um, regulation to impact those rates directly. Yeah. Yeah, I'm always thinking about the ways in which they come up with these ideas, if you like, for these types of things and uh, trying to protect our small businesses and their employees as well, because ultimately the employee employers employ the employees. Um, sort of switching gears just a little bit here. Um, obviously, we've had a lot of mandates come down from uh, the state agencies over the last couple of years because of the pandemic. Um, in the same theme of uh, employers having to basically enforce these things, which is what this lawsuit's about. Um, do you see uh, potential safety violations because man, uh, because employers decide to exercise their constitutional rights and not necessarily follow some of these mandates? Do you see employees turning the employers in for that under this law? I, I think we've had a good hint to that with um, the I don't know what it was called, the, the snitch list or whatever, those public uh, <laughs> complaints right. against employers by not just employees, but, you know, customers or the public. Um, and, uh, you know, that, you know, I think a lot of people at the beginning of the pandemic did not know that that was public by making those complaints. And then we get these lists of um, um, uh, businesses that have, you know, been been turned in. I know I was talking to a constituent that's a dog groomer that um, was having um, neighbors of the, of the grooming shop file complaints saying, oh, I don't think your workers are standing far enough apart when they're grooming a dog. And the, the employers insisting, nope, we've measured, they're six feet apart. And um, But but it, it gets very frivolous very quickly. And, and I can see it going down that same path. Yeah. But, you know, like we said, the, the safety, you know, the WISHA, you know, safety um, standards are, are already in place and paths to re remedy those um, violations are there. Yeah, there's no restriction on whether it needs to be an employee or non-employee. If if somebody just decides that, that there was a violation, they could technically bring a suit against that employer on behalf of the state. And I think that really opens the door up to some very difficult conversations that need to be had. Um, both at the legislative level and obviously in with some of the agencies, because you may you may end up with professional bounty hunters, as you said, representative chambers that are just looking for today. They turn them into L and I, and if L and I shows up and gives the employer a warning, but now they have the ability to actually file a suit and get money from this. Did they just create a? This is where the government created jobs. Maybe they just created a whole new industry of bounty hunters under this bill. So, Patrick, did you have any thoughts on that? Well, I think there's a, a key point you made there. The bill does allow not just a worker, but somebody who puts themselves basically in the shoes of the worker who believes that they have adequate knowledge of a worker um, being in a situation where uh, they're subject to a violation of one of these dozen different uh, safety and, and health regulations. So in the, the case that Representative Chambers mentioned, if you've got a busybody neighbor, um, you know, Gladys Kravitz is probably too old of a reference for most of your audience, but, you know, she's peering at your grooming shop and claiming uh, by her astute powers of observation that your workers are less than six feet apart, um, then, I mean, the law is written, the, the bill as currently written is loose enough that uh, she could be given standing because she claims to have knowledge of a violation. So yeah, uh, another important hole in the bill, uh, another expansion of the ability to sue, another reason why it would be more expensive to insure for liability purposes, uh, and another reason for employers, particularly uh, entrepreneurs just starting out, to really make a, a tough call as to whether or not it's worth giving up what they're doing now to go out on their own when you know, any possible misstep could be used against them, not just to file a complaint with an agency, um, but to allow somebody to go out and, and sue them, even when a violation hasn't actually occurred. Mm. Do you think this will change the hiring process for employers in any way? Obviously we have, and you've mentioned this already several times, Patrick, we already have law in place, which makes this whole thing unnecessary anyway. And we have anti-discrimination law in place already for employers during that process. Um, but do you think employers will be more cautious on hiring because they, they want to make sure that person's in a really good fit and finish because 
you, know, you just don't know what's going to happen. Or, I mean, what are your thoughts on that? In a different labor market, I would probably agree with you. Uh, but as it is right now, when we're showing that uh, almost every employer out there is scrambling for employees, doing everything they can to try and recruit new workers, uh, to get workers who have left the workforce to return. Um, while this may be a consideration, it's hard to make it a top consideration. Um, if you've got customers that you can't serve who are at the door, you want to hire somebody and you're going to be thinking about how can I make the sale? How can I properly staff uh, so that I meet customer demand as opposed to really thinking out the what ifs? Because nobody hires an employee thinking that it's going to become a situation where that worker is aggrieved uh, or maybe in the future and then at some later date may want to file suit. So uh, I, I think that calculus may change if you're fully staffed and there's a whole lot of workers that want to work for you. You can be more selective, uh, but that's not the case right now. It hasn't been for the last uh, at least two years. Okay. I can I can see it sort of impacting employers kind of onboarding process of like how do we how do we ensure that our employees are equipped to know what their their rights are and and that they understand you know these the safety rules the the wage and hour stuff um, and and that you kind of incorporate that in your regular um, HR practices. Mm. Um, so uh, as we move forward here. Uh, uh, Representative Chambers, do you see this bill being reintroduced? Are you hearing anything in the holes, the hallowed holes of Olympia? Well, nobody's hearing anything in Olympia because nobody's there. <laughs> <laughs> that is true. <laughs> um, so uh, just, okay, so just as a matter of process, because the bill was introduced last year, it's automatically alive again this year. Um, obviously, you know, we start session next week. It's a short session, 60 days. Um, there are a number of sort of high profile things that, that we need to address regarding uh, police reform and public safety, uh, the Long-Term Care Trust Act. So, you know, um, I'm not on the labor committee in which this was, you know, originally heard. Uh, so don't know if it's going to, to get a hearing. But, um, you know, I left last session thinking this is probably one of the most significant bills um, that, that people need to pay attention to. And, you know, I think um, folks need to be proactive about um, getting the word out on this one, um, participate if it does have a, another hearing that, that um, employers, um, you know, those that are on uh, the um, webinar today, testify, you know, sign in um, and, uh, you know, with your positions on this bill, um, we're going to be 100% remote this session for those committee hearings. Um, and so the good part of that is it's easy access for people that can can weigh in on a bill without having to physically drive down to Olympia. Mm -hmm. But you know, I don't want to mix words here. We're, we're still missing a very critical component of that in-person face-to-face interaction that, that is, is missing from the public policy making process there. So um, have I heard anything? No. Um, are, are those that want to push this through talking to me? No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, you Am might I be against it. No list? Probably yeah. not. I'm not, I didn't get a Christmas card. So I, I yeah. don't think. Uh, that's funny. Um, well, I know we've had a few questions in the Q&A, so Dave Bose is going to rejoin us here and moderate some questions for us, I believe. That's right, Mark. Uh, thanks so much. Uh, first question, do businesses find that potential employees interview with somewhat of an entitled attitude uh, anyway? Wow, I've just done, personally, I've just done a, a couple of interviews, and that is not necessarily the case, although there was one individual, but um, most employees I've noticed, and we're all employees at some point in our lives, you know, we, we want to do the best job we can and work for the employer and do the best, the, the best type of thing. Um, but yeah, as you go through the interview process, you learn to see if they're going to fit with your other employees. You know, that's what I look for, is I look for fit and finish the years I, I spent at, um, as an employee of some of the big tech corporations around here, um, whenever I had somebody join my team, I was always looking not just for technical competency, but I was always looking for fit and finish. How are they going to react and interact with the other employees in my team? Because I want to make sure that 
you know, any cohesion I have is, is good. So I don't think I did see that. I did on occasion, you had an employee that was like, Hey, this is my job. Why are you even asking me any questions? Just give me the money. Uh, it's not quite Jerry Maguire, but um, you know, you know, you occasionally do, but on, on whole, and I've done probably a thousand interviews. I, I would say less than 1% had that entitlement attitude. I, you know, I, I don't think employees necessarily show up to an interview, um, potential employees show up to an interview with an entitlement attitude at the interview process. That's usually uh, people are nervous. Uh, mm -hmm. They don't, they don't divulge a lot. So, um, uh, you know, but in some of those hires, that's an attitude that we see come out, you know, as, as they start working, um, you know, in, in, in my business, um, I own home care agencies. We provide um, in-home care to seniors and disabled persons. So, um, you know, we're really looking for somebody that has a heart for service and, and that's, so you can kind of go through those technical things. Do you have the skills for this job? Do you have any experience doing this? You know, do we need to provide you some training so that you can take care of our client's needs? And then um, other things get, get revealed uh, later as that, that relationship uh, develops. Um, I think more of that entitlement attitude is more in our culture um, and not necessarily at the interview table. Um. It might be possible that the law itself would, would uh, change human behavior. And this relates to a, uh, another question uh, that I'll, I'll use as a follow-up, which is, and I think you, you touched on it, uh, Representative Chambers, which is, uh, is there anything to prevent someone from using uh, this as a harassment tool or to bring a never-ending stream of, of lawsuits against uh, various employers? Uh, yeah, potentially, potentially. Um, it, it expands who can can you know use it as a weapon because um, it's not just the employee but as the relator um, comes into play they can use it as a weapon against employers yeah there's no reason why you couldn't bring multiples you, you, and because it's got a whistleblower pr um, provision in it uh, that the employer can't retaliate which I, that's fine i mean i wouldn't want to do that anyway but you could see an employee that gets upset about something. Maybe he or she feels that they didn't get the bonus they deserved that year and they decide this is the way to go get that bounty. Then um, they could bring a suit and they can continually bring suits. There's no restrictions on that. They just need to observe what they feel is a workplace violation. And so you could, you could take a business out. I mean, small businesses are operating on some small margins. That's why they're small businesses. And so when you start fining them five, 10, 20, $30,000 over and over again, it's not going to take long before they're out of business and all the employees lose their jobs. So yeah, there's nothing in this bill that stops them from doing that. Next question uh, from Gerald. Can this QUITAM law extend liability to state or federal employees? I don't see why not. I'm uh, just thinking about yeah. it may be preempted at the federal level yeah um, but certainly state workers could should be covered by this uh, as would uh, municipal employees as well um, i think there's every opportunity there for a lawsuit to be brought as representative chamber said earlier against a state agency or against a local government entity for these same type of alleged violations um, I'm not sure you're going to get the same kind of payday out of them that you would uh, perhaps as a uh, going after private sector businesses. Um, but I think the law would allow that unless there's something in there that I missed. That, that would create an interesting conflict of interest for the attorney general's office. That's for sure. When brought to court, this is from Kit, when brought to court, how do bounty hunters establish standing as an injured party? Well, that's the point of this bill. They don't have to. They just have to see the violation or think there's been a violation. That's the, the, the bill effectively establishes their, their ability to be able to sue in the state. That's why it's so dangerous. Next question from Christine. Do you think government is trying to regulate businesses out of business with these laws? I fear the government is trying to take out all business they don't own and run. Representative I'm Chambers. <laughs> Yeah, you know, that's that's sort of the unfortunate kind of um, climate in Olympia is that um, business is quite often vilified, um, not so appreciated and regularly treated as an ATM. 
And I mean, Patrick would know the statistic better, but what, what is, you know, I think small business makes up half the, the businesses in Washington and on average employs five or few, fewer employees. So it's not that every business here is, um, your, your Microsoft, your Boeing, um, there are a lot of small mom and pops that don't have the, the depth of the resources to, to deal with so many frivolous lawsuits. And, you know, I, like I said, I'm a small business owner. I, I literally started my business and built my first desk um, because I couldn't afford to buy one. I bought a shelf at Ikea and, and a piece of plywood that I painted um, to, to make a desk. So when, when you're, and the point behind that is that when you're a small business, you're, you're wearing a lot of hats and um, you know, you have to be your IT person and, and your HR person until you and when you grow and you can um, hire people with those um, deeper level of expertise in your business. But, you know, it just underscores sort of um, not a real friendly environment in, in Washington. Um, you know, believe me, it's crossed my mind. I, I own franchises. I'm geographically tied to this area. And, but I, you know, sometimes the grass looks greener. You go, man, I wish I could do this in another state that's a little more friendly and appreciates the jobs we create here. Let's I would see. Just add that I think that uh, while the legislature probably isn't intentionally trying to regulate um, or legislate businesses out of business, there are a very few number of legislators, and quite frankly, in either party, who have firsthand experience as a business owner, actually signing paychecks, not cashing them. So for the most part, uh, and particularly amongst the majority caucuses, these are folks whose so-called private sector experience at best is working for or running a nonprofit. And usually those nonprofits are getting um, their money from state government. So not even really a competitive kind of situation necessarily, and it's a different experience. So uh, there is honestly, I think, a lack of understanding and knowledge about the impact of the decisions that legislators and agencies make in Olympia uh, on small businesses. Um, they just, I don't think, honestly grasp the notion about how they are strangling the golden goose. And they look to the business community to provide almost unlimited, <laughs> unlimited revenues for all of their spending needs. Uh, but they pass these bills and the common refrain is, well, it's just one more thing. It doesn't take that long. You know, we just need you as a business owner to create, you know, to fill out this one more form or pay this one more tax. And it's really not that much. And they just don't understand the gravity of the situation, the number of straws they're putting on the camel's back. So, um, you know, I don't think it's necessarily a nefarious intent, um, but it's certainly one that is not as well educated as we would hope, which is why it's so important to get folks like Mark Harmsworth and Kelly Chambers uh, and uh, others who have been business owners or are business owners to run for and win election to the state legislature because they bring a wealth of experience and a perspective that is essential to these kinds of conversations and often lacking, particularly in the majority caucuses. I, I appreciate that, uh, Patrick, you know, uh, emphasizing that there, there really is a lack of understanding. And, you know, I was an NFIB member, I gosh, I don't know, 10, 15 years prior to, to, um, to this. And, had heard over and over, you know, as a business owner, you should really, you know, start a relationship with your representative and invite them into your business. And I kind of thought, oh, I don't want them anywhere near my business, but, but how else are we going to build that, that um, level of understanding between what businesses are doing and, and those that are in office in Olympia that are making decisions that, that truly do have a lack of understanding. And um, it, you know, I remember this story, one of I think it was two or three years ago when we were debating the um, B&O tax increase. And of course, you know, small business was highly opposed to this. I talked to um, a member of the uh, majority party afterwards, who also is a, a business owner and said, after the vote was taken on the floor for that B&O tax increase, this person went into their caucus and a member there says, so what's a B&O tax? And it's just like, oh, what a gut punch of, things just being passed without really understanding the impacts that they really do have. And, and, and so that's, that just kind of just makes me cringe and underscores the need for, for um, those that have actually signed both sides of the paycheck to, to be in Olympia and, and be part of that conversation. 
this is obviously a, a huge issue with big impacts. Um, I want to remind people that we do have our resource page at WashingtonPolicy.org where you can get more information or you'll see links uh, to documents and, and other things that are referenced within any panel, including this one. So just go to WashingtonPolicy.org. It's, uh, right, it's featured as the, the main uh, item right now on the main page. I want to thank uh, Mark Harmsworth, our Center for Small Business Director, and Representative Kelly Chambers and, and Patrick Connor, NFIB, um, for, for uh, your participation in this uh, really fascinating, informative, and extremely frustrating panel uh, uh, today. Uh, so thank you. And to, to see more of our small business work here anytime at WPC, just go to the homepage, WashingtonPolicy.org, and you can go to the Center for Small Business tab at the top of that page. Solution Summit will continue here after a short five-minute